Very good afternoon to one and all. Seeking the blessings of His Holiness Jagat Guru Mahaswami Ji, we are going to start the day two of the leadership conclave organized by Internal Quality Assurance Cell, JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research, Mysore. I would like to welcome uh, the Pro Chancellor of JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research, uh, Dr. B. Suresh Sir. Welcome to you, sir, for day two sessions. I would also like to welcome uh, Registrar Dr. B. Manjunath sir. Welcome to you for today's session, sir. And I also like to welcome all the university officials uh, who have joined today's session for uh, making, being an example, setting an example for being the leaders in JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research. Before we begin with today's formal sessions, for the benefit of all the participants as well as all our uh, resource persons, I would like to request uh, Dr. V. Gauramma to kindly recapitulate the proceedings of yesterday's session. Dr. Gauramma, B. O. Thank o. O. You. O. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. A yeah, warm good afternoon to one and all. Gathered you virtually for three days leadership webinar series being organized by Internal Quality Cell, J.S. Sagar, Mysuru from 3rd June to 5th June 2021. I submit my pronouns to the lotus feet of His Holiness Jagat Guru Sri Sivaratri Dejagendra Maga Samikalavaro of Suturmar, Mysore. I express my deep gratitude to all the higher officials of Jesus Agar, Mysore. As a delegate, it is indeed a great pleasure me to be a part of leadership webinar series program I, and I take this opportunity to thank the management of JSS Agar, Mysuru, and JSS College of Pharmacy, Uti, for providing this platform to sharpen my leadership skill. The program was inaugurated at 2 p.m. on 3rd June 2021. Dr. Prashant Viswanath, IQSD coordinator, JSS Agar, Mysuru, welcomed the gathering. Dr. C. Bitsurmat, Honorable Executive Secretary, JSS Magavitya Pida, Mysuru, delivered the inaugural address. Also, he has inspired us with his talk on quality of leadership. In this, SAR has briefed about the five creative skills for nurturing team creativity. The next session was by our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. B. Suresh Sir, as inspired as us, usual with this talk on the topic, great leaders are made not born. Honorable Pro Chancellor elaborated on the five levels of leadership. Level one, highly capable individual. Level two, contributing team member. Level three, competent manager. Level four, effective leader. Level five, executive. Thank you very much, sir, for your such a motivational talk, which inspired us to become future leader. After his session, His Holiness Swamiji, who blessed the event and shared his thought-provoking speech of every individual working, sincere and hardworking, would be recorded for their hard work and should be committed to the development of organization and individually. After his session, Dr. Surendra Singh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, JSS Agar, Mysuru, delivered a talk on how leaders inspire and lead from the front. It was interactive with co-correlating co about creating leaders with some lively examples of his own experience of characteristic of a leader. Lastly, yesterday's session ended with a lecture by Dr. Prashant Kumar, Department of Health System Management Studies, JSS Agar, Mysuru, with their talk on self-analysis of personality traits using various tools which are available to identify oneself about himself of what qualities 
does one process to be a leader the final uh, conclude remark of the webinar was done by done by the honorable pro chancellor and vice chancellor with this i thank all organizer organizer and participants for giving me this great opportunity to share my thoughts with you all thank you all have a great day thank you sir uh thank you dr gaurama ma'am for uh, very lucid explanation description of what has happened yesterday so uh, may i request dr ashwini to kindly brief us in one minute one or 90 seconds about your views of yesterday's session uh, good afternoon sir good afternoon to all with the blessings of his holiness shri jagadguru shri shiva shankar maha swami ji galu warm greetings to all respected uh, dr c g betsumar executive secretary jss mahavidya peeta honorable pro chancellor dr p s so b suresh jss hr dr surinder singh vice chancellor jss hr dr manjunath registrar jss hr and dr prashant vishwanath coordinator iqac jss hr is an honor and privilege to have an opportunity to share the thoughts and the gist of the talk from the renowned speakers Jack Well said before you are a leader success is all about growing yourself when you become a leader success is all about growing others with such leaders amongst us dr betsumar sir gave us an elaborate outlook about leadership quality the role of leaders duties of the leader and the vision as a leader and he also spoke about importance of creativity innovation communication and he also emphasized on leader should always be a problem solver sir as you said leadership is a style of providing providing directions implementing plans and motivating people it is a result of philosophy personality and experience sir thank you for making us understand that leadership is a vision and responsibility not a power thanks sir for such a wonderful talk and in continuation of his talk a beloved pro chancellor spoke about great leaders are made not born the five different levels of leadership quality was well described which made us all introspect ourselves and see where we stand and which area requires improvement and the story about the himalaya swami who went up to the you know have the jiva samadhi was interesting which made us realize yes when we grow as a leader we should have an ability to listen respect and understand the perception of others and consider their point as well leaders don't create followers they create more leaders sir we could see our own people becoming leaders under your able guidance and the bird which comes to your window and the keen observation you have tells us all the quality as a leader one should have also the quality of reciprocating to everyone's need thank you sir for making us realize the quality of good leader and emphasizing on great leaders are made not born thank you sir once again the next talk was on living example of leadership or leaders inspire and lead from the front was a beautiful talk from our vice chancellor dr sudinder singh we had a broad view about the adaptivity authenticity and the charismatic leadership and the roles of leader he articulated frontliners beautifully the good quality of good leaders should be forward looking make a right choice have a good observation non biased have a timely action and responsibility large perspectives and always replace i with we and never give up attitude and empathy an example he leave with his real life stories sir you as a leader your empathy towards the people was evident it was an inspiring talk i i must say sir also believe in teamwork together everyone achieve more thank you for setting the example of world change by your examples and being a living example of your values thank you sir aristotle said knowing yourself is a beginning of all the wisdom dr prashant kumar gave us an awareness on self analysis he also helped us to know what and where we stand as a growing leaders with lot of personality tests he emphasized on knowing self is a skill becoming self aware as a leader doesn't happen overnight rather it takes years of deep work reflection introspection and difficult conversation with those you work with where we grow together as a good human being investing in your own personal growth will encourage a more 
inclusive and a successful culture. Thank you for making us aware that real introspection is to know both our strength and weakness, not just our weaknesses. Thank you. I personally believe leaders should be approachable, accommodative, should identify and promote people, and good leaders are always problem solvers. Leadership is an action, not a position. Every leader should have a commitment, individual commitment to a group effort. That is what makes a team work, a company work, a society work, a civilization work. Leaders should become, leaders become a great, not because they have power, but because they empower others. I proudly say you are associated with such powerful leaders. Thank you, sir. Thanks for such a wonderful session of yesterday. Uh, thank you very much, Ashwini, ma'am, for, uh, you know, very well explaining about what all things happened yesterday. It was real uh, crisp summary. Thank you so much for that. So, uh, before we begin with uh, today's session, let us have an overview of what all things we are going to have today. So, today we have got three talks. One is on technology and ba technology, the backbone of future education. And second is on education and work life in 2021 and beyond. And third is building a culture of accountability. And uh, to give these sessions, we have eminent speakers around us. So who are going to enlighten us about all these aspects. Before I formally introduce our first speaker, I would like to request the Pro-Chancellor of JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research to give an opening remark. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Praveen, um, uh, for inviting me. And uh, before we go off to the program, I think uh, uh, I would like to uh, share uh, our uh, uh, grief and uh, prayers uh, with Dr. Prashant and his uh, uh, family. Uh, immediately after the afternoon uh, session in the evening, just as he was completing and I congratulated Prashant that for a wonderful session, uh, he messaged me back. He lost his mother yesterday evening, just at that time. It was a very uh, grieving moment for him and for all of us. And uh, I told him, don't worry, we'll take care of it. And uh, I mean, I don't worry, you let us know what is the help. His reply was, don't worry, sir. Tomorrow's session, I hand it over to Kulkarni, he will take care. So such is the responsibility and attitude of a person who's having, who manifests himself to leadership positions. He sees, even in times of challenges, which may be personal or professional, he always keeps the things of uh, around him should not get disrupted and helps keep moving forward. I think this is just, again, a good example of such type of traits which one should cultivate. Uh, I think um, this, I find a lot of uh, good things happening because of this type of training program. Now, I got at least a few messages yesterday evening after the session that uh, uh, everybody is trying to find out in which level he is or what quality he has got, uh, where he is. But uh, the question is, you no, know, everybody is interested to become a leader. They want to move forward. They are motivated that they should do something better. They should do move further. I think this is something is really, really very good for uh, yourself and for the organization. Uh, we may reach different levels. It doesn't matter. Everybody plays an uh, important role. Like yesterday I said, if Rahul Dravid was not there or VVS Lakshman was not there, then their captains would have not been able to succeed what they contributed. So the captain succeeded using their position. So everybody is contributing. Leadership positions come and go in different ways and different uh, manners. So that's going to be there. We are going to hear today again to three important leaders. I'm sure uh, Praveen is going to introduce you uh, to all of them. But uh, particularly, I would like to mention here uh, Dr. Arun Hambapur, who I connected just online on LinkedIn. I came to know that he is a SJC alumni and I wanted to reach out to find who are all our alumni from uh, SJC and I was uh, screening and he was there in uh, the thing I connected with him and then we started connecting with each other. It just happened. And uh, he is from technology background. I am from uh, medical or health sciences background, whatever you can tell, but we connected. Then we started talking on so many common things and he's back here in India. From, he was in US. Uh, for a long time with IBM and other uh, health uh, technology organizations back here. And we still are connected. So I think this is something very, very important. And one of the qualities you should learn is don't think, oh, this particular field is not belonging to me. Why should I do 
uh, connected with that. You don't know when, what you will need. Always these connections uh, matter a lot today. And not today, even, even earlier. It is good relationship connections which you maintain helps you to move on with your uh, life and career. And of course, uh, technology is going to be spoken about by uh, Dr. Arun Hambagur. And uh, work-life balance. Yesterday, there was one of the questions in the session. Uh, what about work-life uh, uh, and family life? How are you going to balance that? Uh, and how it is going to happen in 2021? Uh, Dr. Dayanand is going to speak because he's seeing all the situations around the uh, hospital and he's going to share you his thing. And uh, nobody else can be uh, more uh, fit to uh, talk about the culture of accountability. Everybody wants responsibility. Everybody wants position. But they do not, when it questions of why you have not done it, how can you ask me is the reaction we give. So I think Dr. Ravi has been one person who's personified. I know him for now so many years uh, uh, here. After coming to university and before uh, uh, that also I know him. He is one person who is always responsible and accountable. Whatever he will do, uh, he will try and come back and tell you why he has done and how he is doing it and what he expects from us. That's a very good quality and he's going to share this. I think today we have a very good session to build some of the qualities in you. Yesterday we talked what makes a leader. Uh, today we are going to talk what will help you become a leader. I think this is uh, something which is very important for all of you. And I wish this session a very good uh, success. I'll be around and I'll be happily listening and learning myself. Because one thing which my teacher told me when I was studying is if you want to succeed in your life, never stop learning. Every day you have to do something. Do a little bit of learning every day. And I sincerely do it every day. Not a single day goes without my trying to explore a new area and understand about it. So thank you very much and all the best. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you for inspiring words. So uh, with this, we will begin with our uh, today's session. I would like to introduce our first speaker, an eminent speaker, I would like to say. Eminent is a word that is going to explain him quite well. Uh, Dr. Arun Hambapur. He's a founder and CEO, Bloom Value Corporation. Arun Hambapur has a PhD in artificial intelligence from University of Michigan. He has 25 years of experience in enterprise, AI solutions in media and entertainment, homeland security, smart cities, retail, and IT services. Most of his 25 years of industry experience was at IBM Research in Yorktown Heights, New York. Starting as a research staff member, Arun has helped launch several AI products in IBM and holds 150 plus patents. Arun was appointed as Distinguished Engineer at IBM for his contributions to video surveillance technology and solutions. His last role in IBM research was the Director of Commerce Research, which he led a team of PhDs in AI technologies for customer engagement, marketing, pricing, sourcing, and several other e-commerce functions. He's the fellow of the Institute of, Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. He wrapped up his uh, tenure as IBM at IBM in August 2020 as Distinguished Engineer and Director of Development for AIOPs to launch Bloom Value Corporation. It is a great pleasure to have you around us, sir. Here he is going to talk about technology, the backbone of future education. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Praveen. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. We can hear you, sir. Please share your screen. Yeah, and... Namaskara, sir. Allargo Namaskara. Uh, uh, and thanks to Dr. Suresh and other leadership for uh, having me on this meeting. Uh, I will share my screen here. So uh, I noticed that one of the things that was not on my bio. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. We can screen. We can see your screens. Uh, was uh, that I'm a proud alumni of SCSE, uh, ENC batch of 1987, and a lot of uh, the foundation for uh, my professional and technical uh, career has been laid at uh, at JC. So, and uh, thanks to Dr. Suresh, uh, we're fortunate to be working back again with uh, with JSS uh, in in my current company. So. Uh, 
I'm going to do a bit of introduction of my background, so it, it helps. And uh, we'll talk about what's changing in education, uh, what can we learn from other industries, uh, how can campus-based higher education transform. And uh, the title is Technology is the back, Backbone of Future Education, but uh, uh, thanks to Dr. Ravindra and uh, Dr. Prashant, who gave me a crash course on how JSS itself is using technology. I'm saying that technology is already the backbone of education. There's plenty more to do, but it is already there. And finally, we'll wrap up by just uh, sharing what the company is doing currently. Um, so when Dr. Prashant reached out to me, uh, I said, look, uh, my company works on hospitals, hospital optimization, things like that. Uh, what do you want me to talk about? He said, talk about education. Uh, I said, can I talk about hospitals and hospital optimization? He said, no, 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 this is about education. You have to talk about education. So I'm not an expert on education technologies, right? I have not studied it before. So I kind of took it up as a challenge to see what is it that I can learn. So as uh, Dr. Suresh was saying, uh, it's an opportunity to learn. Uh, so I put something together. If uh, all of you experts in education find something off, uh, please pardon me. While I have not worked in education, I worked in several other industries, uh, security, city management, travel transport, retail, and now finally with hospitals. And in all of these industries, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with great teams, uh, which is uh, both from the customer side and from uh, uh, my technical teams. And we've all, I've been involved in digital transformation projects using AI, big data, and other technologies. So what I thought I would do is look at what is changing in education, right? Ask that question. And uh, today, if you know what question to ask, you can find the answer. Uh, Google will give you the perfect answer. So I have uh, a point of view. And uh, more than a presentation, it's a somewhat of a discussion. So if uh, uh, any of you have a point of view, please interrupt me, stop me, ask questions. Uh, let's, uh, let's find out where education is going, right? So, when you say what's changing in education, uh, you can't but help pick up on Baiju's, right? So company founded in 2011 uh, now has uh, a $300 million revenue. And uh, so that, that tells you everything, that graph, right? You see the revenue, it's, it's growing almost vertically up. It's, it's, it sound, looks like the pandemic curve in terms of how quickly the revenue is shooting. And, and this is 373 million US dollars of, uh, of revenue. Uh, so I had to do some math to convert it. So that is 2,611 crores. That's their revenue in 2020. But what is even more interesting is how many students they have. So as an organization, Baiju's has 6.4 crore students who are getting education through Baiju's. I just something for us to look at and absorb. There's something going on here that is fundamentally different, right? Because most, uh, even JSS, which is a huge uh, educational organization, possibly over the course of its lifetime has had maybe five lakh students, 10 lakh students. Uh, I don't know the exact number, sir, but it is not in crores, right? But Baiju's has 6.4 crores and they're just getting started, right? They're just a new, co a new, new company. So what's even more interesting is how much investment they're getting. So this is one of the hottest tech sectors where uh, investment from all over the world is pouring into Indian uh, tech companies. And Baiju's themselves in 2020, they raised $2 billion in investment, right? So again, I had to go do some multiplication in math. $2 billion is 14,000 crore rupees, right? That's how much investment they're getting to drive online education. So whether we like it or not, higher education is going to get impacted by Baiju's and all of their, all of this online ecosystem one way or the other. The question really is how, how is it, how is it going to impact online uh, campus-based higher education, which is where we've all grown up, right? So just to understand what we're talking about here, I wanted to see how to compare this 14,000 crores so 14,000 crores is one fourth of the Karnataka state budget. So this year, Karnataka state budget is 58,000 crores. So Baiju's one single company 
has raised 14,000 crores of investment money, right? In addition to the revenues that they're getting. So the question simply is, how long before Baiju's or some other players jumps into higher education, right? They're gonna do it. They have all of the infrastructure, they're already, how long before they offer up some kind of a hybrid engineering degree or a hybrid online medicine degree? With, the, with COVID happening, even engineering and medicine classes are how, happening offline. This is what uh, I wanted to highlight is what's, what's going on. But you know, Baiju's is not waiting. They're already in higher education, right? So they're offering up uh, IAS uh, entrance exam courses and uh, already having quite a bit of success. So this is a trend that we who are in higher education from a campus perspective, we can't ignore this, right? Because it's just, it, it's in the same field. It is today K through 12 education, but uh, there's no reason why it can't go to engineering or medicine or pharmacy or any other discipline, right? Uh, so this is something to keep in mind. But it's not just uh, Baiju's uh, that is changing. The Stanford University uh, is offering uh, like hundreds of uh, medical and CME courses online. Right? And uh, uh, this was before the pandemic. Now with the pandemic, uh, so for example, this uh, bioinformatics degree, you can do 80% of it online today. Right? So it's not long before full engineering and medical co medicine courses would become some kind of hybrid online, right? 80% being online and 20% being in a campus, right? So this is, uh, this is the change that's coming. And uh, it's, it's such a, typically when uh, online disrupts any sector, it has a tremendous impact on that sector because of the scale of online companies. Uh, we can safely say that there is no campus education that has 6.4 crore students as compared to Baiju's, right? We can safely say that. So this is something for us to think about. So what I said we could do is say, let's look at another industry where this kind of a disruption has happened and how that industry has evolved. So with that, I'm switching to retail, which is where we know online has come in and disrupted and changed retail in dramatic ways. Uh, but stores haven't gone away, right? Even now there are stores. Uh, we don't know what, what the pandemic is going to do to all these things. We'll figure that out. But uh, this is a 2019 uh, number. So the sales growth in 2019, 2020 uh, for regular brick and mortar physical stores was 3.4%. And for e-commerce it was 15%. There's a five X difference in growth year to year between e-commerce and uh, uh, physical store-based commerce, right? So the, uh, and I, I, I missed uh, doing this chart here, yet the survey here says 70% of the people prefer to shop in the store. So when you go ask people, what do you want to do? They still say, I want to shop in the store, but the cost economics and the cost dynamics and the ease of shopping simply changes. Yeah, we want to go to a store, but there's many reasons. If you can just click online and buy it, you might as well do that, right? So while education is not exactly buying and retail, it has a very different dynamic, it still is something to, to think about. So what I've, uh, what needless to say, the e-commerce disruption has been going on for 20 years now. Uh, in India, it's a little more recent in the US as much older, but the pandemic has basically accelerated that, uh, that trend. So between uh, Q2 of 2020, 2019 and 2020, online global sales almost doubled right, because of the pandemic. Uh, and while that doubling happened, retail went the other way. Right? So these kinds of trends are going to have a significant impact on retail. So what I did is I picked a case study uh, to look at how were a brick and mortar or physical retailers, this is a US case study, dealing with this online growth, right? So even today in, in the US and of course in India, it's still an early trend e-commerce, but even in the US, 
uh, regular stores haven't gone away. They're still there, right? They're just not growing. Uh, online keeps growing at a very, very high pace, but regular stores continue to be, be in place. So question is, what will happen? Five more years from now, will stores go away, right? Will you not have physical stores? Uh, will you have st physical stores only for certain categories? What happens? So what you also notice is that the idea of online versus the physical, it's not correct in the sense that it's never a clean separation. So Amazon has actually set up a number of stores in the US and a lot of brick and mortar retailers have set up websites and are selling their same products online. But what you find is that's not good enough when a physical store just sets up a website and puts their same products online. That isn't good enough to compete with uh, the Amazons of the world. The reason being uh, the cost structures that go behind a physical store is vastly different from what goes behind a completely pure play online retailer, right? And that makes a big, big difference. And also the, their sourcing strategies, where they get their material from, all kinds of stuff are different between online and physical stores. So just setting up an online store doesn't make, make you competitive in the e-commerce business. And uh, the best case of recovery in this case, in, in, in uh, retail is uh, the company called Best Buy, right? It's a, it's a US uh, electronics retailer and uh, Best Buy, uh, this is their, their website. So you can go to bestbuy.com and they are basically a consumer electronics uh, store uh, and they have an online uh, presence and they sell all kinds of stuff. Now, they have 997 physical locations in the US, right? So these are the stores. They, what you see here is a picture of the Best Buy store and what's inside it. This is the transformed store. And uh, basically around 2010, Best Buy was almost killed by Amazon, right? So what you're seeing here is the year-to-year -year, uh, growth of their revenue. Uh, and you know, you'll see that 20, 20, 2006, uh, they've been growing uh, reasonably well. And by around 2010, the online trend kicks in and they start losing business, right? They start shrinking as a business. And pretty much uh, from 2010, almost all the way to 2018, eight years, uh, that company is completely uh, in, in a struggle to figure out how to transform its business to this new world where online is going, going to stay, right? And they did something very interesting. And finally, now they've turned around. Uh, so if you see, look at 2020, 2021, uh, they are growing, right? And that little blip there is the kicking in of the pandemic right? when, when, when they shrunk a little bit. And there's a very nice uh, article in Forbes around the Best Buy turnaround. And uh, it's considered a very inspiring uh, and uh, example story of how physical versus online come together and what is the change. So the question is, what did Best Buy do in order to get to this uh, growth again after struggling with the online competition, right? So uh, they did five things, right? So they brought in outside leadership, right? So they actually brought in a hotel expert to run a retail store. <laughs> so what happens often is we, when we're grown up in a certain industry, we view things in a certain way. So the first thing they did is they brought in an outside person to just look at their business from a different perspective. Um, number two is very important. A lot of the transformative ideas are actually sitting right now within this call of how higher education needs to be transformed. That uh, is with the employees of JSS because they are on the ground. They've been doing this for a while. So they know, just they know what to do. So, but we need to figure out how to tap into that expertise. So they found a way of enabling employees to come up with ideas and contribute and using the employee skills uh, to kind of go through this uh, transformation. Number three, they struck some big deals with uh, big tech players like Samsung, Apple, and Microsoft. Uh, and number four, they actually started making house calls. So often when you have a TV or you're trying to wire up something at home, things may not work. So Best Buy started saying, hey, we have physical locations, so we will send people to your house. It's a new, new way of doing business, right? And finally, number five, they transformed their philosophy. 
they said, look, we are not selling, before they were selling electronics, they changed that to saying, we're offering expertise in electronics. So if you go into a Best Buy store today, you will actually see experts in Mac and Windows. So if you have a question about your Mac or about your Windows, something is not working, you can take it in there and they will help you. They will help you for free, right? So that is a transformation, how they think about what they do. They're no longer thinking about selling electronics. They're saying we're offering expertise in electronics. So this is an example of how online disruption actually transformed uh, 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 a physical uh, store uh, company. Uh, something worth looking at and thinking about as we see education being transformed, which is inevitably happening, especially with the pandemic, uh, which is accelerating this. So the question is, what does transformation mean? What are changes? What, what do we have to do? Right? So usually when you look at an industry, and say it's transforming, the, the tra changes come in two buckets. One is improving existing operations and the other is transforming our offerings. So improving existing operations like JSS, you know, uh, I, I love the campus. It, it's beautiful, it's huge, but it is a cost in our books, right? What does it cost to run a campus? How can that be reduced? Do we need such a big campus? These are questions that are going to come up right and you know how do like one the minute you say online everything is you get lots of details and data how do we provide the same experience to students right how do we get visibility into how our operations run right uh, in a multi campus organization and how can we make that more efficient you know all of these are internal transformation questions on the left side uh, which will need to be addressed so that your cost and cost structure fundamentally changes and on the right side is a transformation of what you offer the students, right? So online courses inherently have more choice. Right? I can sit here and take a course in engineering from Stanford. Uh, and soon enough, somebody is going to go to the regulatory authorities and allow me to get a degree from Stanford sitting here in Bangalore. It's gonna happen, right? It's not, a, it's not a far off place. So the question then is, what's the compelling reason to bring students into a single physical location? Why should we do that? Like, what is it that you're going to get? And if the pandemic continues for a little longer, then just that disruption would have been significant. A question is what, if somebody comes to a campus, what is that transformative experience, right? You know, maybe higher ed could strike deals with companies to say, yes, online, you can go and do a course, but if you come to the campus, we get you much more ready to go to an IBM or a, a, a Microsoft. What is that extra that, online or campus-based education can do? And I'll leave you with the question. I don't have answers to these. So what does the future campus, 20, 50 campus of JSS look like? Will it still have so many buildings and rooms? Uh, will we have hostels? Uh, will we need to run big canteens? It's a fascinating question to ask. Uh, I see Dr. Suresh smiling. I'm sure he's been thinking about all these, but uh, to me, this is what is coming because of what online is going to do to education. Uh, and it's not always a threat. It's sometimes an opportunity if we think about it the right way. Often those like Best Buy, when you think about that as an example, uh, a lot of retailers get afraid of online and they get into a fight mode. You just have to figure out, it's coming, right? So it's like a new thing. You just need to figure out how to leverage it and transform ourselves. And that can make a big, big uh, difference. So, uh, not many answers, but uh, hopefully interesting questions for, for the team here to think about. And finally, uh, thanks to Dr. Ravindra and Dr. Prashant, uh, they gave me a crash course on what JSS is already doing with technology. Uh, and this is my picture. So Dr. Ravindra and Prashant, if it is uh, wrong, if it's off, if I've missed details, please, uh, please excuse me. I tried and took as good notes as I possibly could. But already today, uh, you have a master data management system that drives several online portals, uh, starting from a registration and admissions all the way through results and graduation. Online is touching the, the student and the teacher experience in JSS. Um, and uh, they did tell me about the dashboards that they already have, the final metrics, payments, uh, workflow, uh, RBAC, 
uh, two-factor authentication, all of these technologies are already in place. And you already have, uh, uh, Dr. Ravindra mentioned that uh, they gave results to 4,700 uh, students in a, couple, a matter of a couple of days. Uh, the last time they, uh, they did an exam for, uh, for medicine. So uh, there's already a lot ongoing with technology at JSS, but uh, I'm pretty sure there's many, many more innovations that can be brought to bear. Uh, and also we need to be looking ahead. Right? The, the Baiju's model is going to come and change things some way. The question is, how can JSS get ahead of that curve? What is it, Why, what is that thing that JSS would do to basically become the, the, the leader in hybrid education, uh, which is leveraging the campus in interesting ways uh, and giving students something that they simply cannot get online. And how, how do we do that cost efficiently? Because online always comes with that advantage. It's always more cost efficient. So that's a, a big, big, big challenge. So this is what uh, GS is already doing. So thanks to Dr. Ravindra and Dr. Prashant for the crash course yesterday. Um, and I'm going to wrap up here. So I did a quick introduction. We looked at what's changing in education. Obviously, I just scratched the surface. I'm sure there's plenty more that's going on. Uh, we looked at how retail is handling online disruption and what kinds of things Best Buy did. It's a great case study. So I encourage folks who are trying to look at this problem to go look at that, uh, that industry. And we looked at what questions are there uh, that we need to address when higher ed transforms. And lastly, uh, we took, took a quick view of what technology already is in JSS. Um, and I'm gonna wrap by just sharing uh, what uh, our company Bloom Value does. Uh, so we are uh, a hospital optimization company. For all practical purposes, we are helping hospitals transform. It's the same paradigm, uh, although online is not such a big disruptor in healthcare. It's, still, it's simply not the same, same scale, but COVID may change a few things. So we're looking at many different areas uh, and specifically with, uh, with uh, JSS Hospital, uh, with Dr. Dayananda's team, we're working on uh, hospital performance insights. Uh, we've been on the project for about four or five weeks now. It's been a little slower because of the pandemic and uh, some disruptions we've had within our own team, uh, but uh, we're in, uh, uh, we're in a very good partnership with uh, uh, Bhagavan sir and Sadananda sir who are helping us tremendously uh, on this. So uh, that's my uh, quick quick view on how technology uh, is going to be the backbone and how that can help transform uh, higher ed. So I want to thank uh, you for having me on the call and uh, giving me the opportunity to actually go learn about higher education and what's happening within that field. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for that enlightening session. So uh, you have tried to link between the technology and education. And most of us who work in education technologies at initial days before this pandemic, we had very little competencies related to how to apply technology in education. And as a part of a boom from this pandemic is, we are getting accustomed with the technology and the technology is helping us. A new competency that most of us as the uh, teachers of health profession education, uh, we have learned in this pandemic is how to adapt ourselves to the technologies. And you have used very uh, pertinent life, uh, you know, real life examples, starting from which is very commonly used from Baiju's and you have ended up with how JSS is actually performing with uh, the technology as a part of its routine activities, starting from new management to completely conducting the exams online and giving the results on a very fast track basis. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, it was a great uh, pleasure listening to you. We have a couple of uh, questions uh, from our uh, participants. Before we go to the questions, I think uh, if uh, Pro Chancellor, sir, wants to add anything, I request sir to add. Oh, let's have the questions, uh, Praveen, because we, yes. I'm sure he will have other commitments. So we can have it at this time from him. Maybe sure. those who have raised their hands, we can do, or you can ask the questions uh, yourself to Arun and uh, I mean to Arun and uh, um, get his inputs. Sir. Sure, sir. Uh, so there are I, I can see two questions on the board. One is in future teaching and learning is going to be a, going to be social with the introduction of cloud technology. 
uh, sir do you think this will change the role of a teacher uh for for sure for sure because when we were studying i'll just go back uh, uh, the teacher always knew more than the student right because they had studied so education was about gathering information that's that's how we studied you know you had to go read and learn formulas and and that's storing knowledge was what education was about uh that's no longer going to be the case because nobody is ever going to learn i mean you need to learn the principles you need to learn how to apply things uh, so the role of a teacher is going to be much more of a coach uh than a teacher so in you know when you look at a cricket team to use dr suresh's example the player already knows how to play cricket right so you, <laughs> so in that sense it's going to become something about more than just telling somebody you have to hold the bat this way and you need to hold the ball this way right? it's a it's a much more of an interactive and an engaged thing so it's going to, my suspicion is it's going to be way more project based uh where students are learning online you know and coming up with the knowledge and uh, the teacher is actually helping them apply it in interesting ways so it's, it's my my two cents because today i didn't know anything about higher education when i started preparing for this talk and i am able to deliver to hopefully credibly to a bunch of higher expert higher education experts a point of view how is that possible <laughs> it's possible because information is out there if you know what question to yes. ask you'll find the answer right so but how do you encourage kids to ask the right question and be inquisitive uh, that's a different role it's not how traditionally teachers have been at least uh, when i went to uh, when i when i was going to college if you asked a question you would be considered <laughs> disrespectful <laughs> you know asking questions was not a good thing i mean things have changed possibly but uh, yeah thank you very much sir uh, uh we have one more question i think it's the last question uh, sir uh, uh, education and healthcare they are two different sectors so education is a kind of a service you know industry and health is a service sector and how technology will you know uh, merge both of them how do you compare both of them so actually uh, education and healthcare are much more similar Uh, when you compare them to something like manufacturing they both fall into the service sector and if you look at both the fields they are anchored around the expert right if you look at a hospital there's a bunch of doctors and the qualified lab techs and nurses they, that they become the core of it uh, whereas in education it's the same thing it's the the teachers and the expert in medicine it's got a lot more equipment and process and procedure involved in education it's a bit lesser but what i'm saying is in education it has to be more meaning uh projects and development uh and uh live labs have to be way more in education and so education is going to become more similar to medicine uh and healthcare uh, across the fields because you'll need people actually playing with stuff so and, and and mixing chemicals to make new pharmacology things uh hands on right so you will see that transformation where those two come closer together yeah uh, thank you very much sir i think uh, you answer you have answered most of our questions i think remaining we will take up as a part of our question answer sessions so uh, i would like to place in yes sir yeah um, thank you arun uh, for the uh, very clear focused uh, direction you have uh, given in the approach that education should uh, uh, look at and look at it in a large perspective um i think and you have also triggered the right way what does uh, 2050 look for jss uh, already i think we have put that thought process in our uh, team who are much younger uh, to me and they would be able to see the uh, 2050 themselves but i think we have given them some works and efforts to move forward and uh, jss very strongly believes uh, that uh, uh, two things that it wants to grow exponentially uh that is one of the things very clear that's what this year and this year is uh, this particularly this year of 2021 we are focused that it will be all about technology strengthening the technology at our university in every way possible whether it is uh, communication whether it is interpretation or data or whichever way we are going to do technology is going to play our priority this is what we have been uh, uh, defined ourselves 
and we look forward to your support. The very idea of uh, inviting you to give this uh, talk here is to, I know your rich experience, be it in whichever different sectors are there, would be very valuable to us to learn from you. And we look forward to your continuous being with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Namaskar. I'm going to drop off. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot.